Dan Martin dressed for work down at the start this morning. Perhaps he's going to escort the peloton to the border. Just under 200 kilometres today, taking the race out of Andorra and into Spain for good. The third category, Alto del Beltal, is the only hill that merits an official classification. The intermediate sprint, should it become a factor, is after 167 kilometres, and there should be a bunch version in Tarragona. A grinding one, though, the last 500 metres to the line have a 3 or 4% gradient. So Rosetto has attacked Rubio, Rubio has attacked Rosetto, but the net outcome is that these two are still together, locked together, very equally matched and still working together. At this point at least, 10 kilometers remaining now and 18 seconds to go. They know that the peloton are right on them. This is a pretty hopeless task. And there, Marcus finally gets it, gets going. That was a long wait, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, far too long, really. Uh, it's, um but it goes to show how the priorities change when it's not an out-and-out out out team leader. Uh, everyone's a little bit more relaxed, let's say, and uh, they all know the situation. But at the same time, I guess they've got the second team car that will now be ahead monitoring the peloton if something does happen to Adam Blythe. So this is it now. The catch is uh, right upon us. Well, Blythe is handily placed on the... Uh just on the wheel of Matteo Trentino. That's Adam Blythe. He's got, I think, must be Aaron Gate or Lasse Norman Hansen working for him. So one more teammate for Adam Blythe just to pilot him through this stressful final phase. As the catch is affected, Stefan Rosetto is gobbled up by uh, quick step floors and the bunch sprint is now upon us. 7.8 kilometers remaining. It's all come back together again. Quick step floors, as you would expect on the front with four riders. Then come Adam Blythe and one lead out man. And then it's a combination of different teams. Still, I think you've got the likes of TJ Van Garder and quite close to the front team sky not far behind with the red jersey of Chris Froome visible in about 12th wheel yeah and quick step really uh, taking control they're aware of uh, what this finish is as all of the teams will be they'll have received their morning briefing and then they'll have been getting the the intel from the the, the staff ahead of the race driving into the finish who will then call back and, and let the DS's know and who will then radio it forward again so if you don't know then that's uh, a lack of professionalism because the information is there for you and, uh, but at the same time, it's one thing knowing it, it's one thing then hitting at race speed in that high stress situation. So even the best laid plans of mice and men can, can come to fall in a, in a race situation. It's the 13th time that the Vuelta has visited Tarragona in its history. And uh, I don't think it's going to be showing it off to its absolute best today as we finish in a kind of industrial estate on the outskirts of town. Nonetheless, a beautiful city with a Roman amphitheatre, twinned with Avignon, Pompeii and Stafford. I discovered today. Back to the race, 6.6k to go. Border Hansgrohe beginning to show their colours in the black kit with those green shoes in the middle. They've got a fast finishing German, Michael Schwarzmann. Had a good race on the other bunch sprint on stage two, finishing just behind Sasha Modolo in what, fifth, sixth place. Tom van Asbroek as well, don't rule him out from Cannondale. They've got a uh, fast finishing Dutchman there to look after. And there's an attack from one of the uh, Manzana Postabon riders opportunistic move unlikely to succeed but let's have a go they do have a sprinter actually a molano young sprinter who finished in third place at uh, gp dinner earlier on in uh, quite illustrious company actually only beaten by arno de Mar and nasa buani so he's one to watch out for if a pink jersey does pop up in the expected bunch sprint it's likely to be molano and you can see by the how the peloton hasn't reacted how they're they're not really concerned by that attack they they know how the what's going to happen. The fact that you have all these teams spread across the road, no one's really put the hammer down yet. The the final phase of leadouts hasn't begun. And the moment that that starts, then uh, very few riders are, are capable of 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 holding them off. And there we see jungles behind, who's actually leading the train for quick step. Uh, so there's a there's big end. There are big engines on the front of the peloton. There's Orica Scott the G, riding GC. There are. There's Team Sky there sitting on the edge of the road, just trying to keep Chris Froome out of trouble, just gone out of shot. Uh, so, you know, there's a mixed, a mixed bag at the moment at the front, but before long, I think we'll see, see one team showing dominance. I think it's Hernando Borroquez, the 25-year-old uh, Colombian who is the attacker. But Trek Segafredo seem intent on uh, dragging him back, and they're not the only team, and that move has uh, come to an end already. Sunweb uh, sweep past them. Soren Craig Anderson might be a rider who could take the victory on a kind of sprinter's field like the one assembled at this edition of the Vuelta. Little bit second string, 
does provide an opportunity for riders who might otherwise never dream of a Grand Tour victory to get one. Adam Blythe has been knocking on the door. Three Giro d'Italia, this is his first participation in the Vuelta. Can Adam Blythe finally get that longed-for Grand Tour victory? He doesn't win often, Adam Blythe. He places well on uh, far too many occasions, but he has, everyone says, everyone who's known him over recent years knows that he has the potential to pull off a Grand Tour victory at some point in his career, and today is as good an opportunity as he will ever face. Yeah, and it, is a, it really is an opportunity. This, the Vuelta is a race that suits him. There we can see the, the finish and, and how bizarre it is <laughs> in contrast, kind of the area. And uh, this is going to be a kind of a, a little bit of a strange area for, for the race finish. Four kilometres to go. Border Hansgrohe will have control now. Schwarzman is the uh, mustachioed figure in fourth wheel there. So he's got three of the uh, strongest men working for him. On the front, then comes uh, Jonas van Genechten from Kofidis. Lotto Sudal uh, manoeuvring Jens de Buschere. Now, he's a fast man, Jens de Buschere. Only 45th, so he didn't really contest a bunch sprint last time. We had that opportunity. Of course, there wasn't a bunch sprint in the end because Quick Step Floors produced that surprise tactic and Yves Lampard time-trialed his way to victory within the final kilometre, attacking, and no one caught him. It was a brilliant tactic, but I'm not sure it's one they're going to play again or indeed capable of playing again. This looks like it's going to stay together all the way to the finish. Oh, more riders have come down. It's a, there is a, a AG Tuala Mondial jersey on the ground. It's not bad day. A uh, couple of riders from Manzana. Posso Vivo, Vivo, it looks like, from AG Tuala. So uh, it's an important rider. Yeah, but he looks OK. He's yeah. on straight away. He wasn't one of the first down. Um, but there... That's, da that's Danny Moreno, isn't it? No, it's not. It's... Uh, uh, forgive me, it's... Um, yeah, it is. You're right, Danny. Yeah, Danny Moreno, it is. Yep. And they're just out, they were just outside the 3K, so that's unfortunate for them in regards to uh, getting the same time as the winner well, as that rule dictates. Well, Movistar just goes from bad to worse for them. He is their best-placed rider in the general classification, Danny Moreno. 14th place, 120 down. He's their best hope for a top 10 finish and he's only now just getting on his bike so he will almost certainly be losing more time in GC. That was interesting just there before we saw the quick step rider getting mixed up in the Bora train and trying to shake his shaking his head and trying to move out of it and the Bora rider behind saying no and eventually them having to kind of succumb to it and having to move up because the teams don't like being split up but sometimes it's in your benefit and the the quick step rider knew there that it was in his benefit to, to get back and the Bora was trying not to let him but eventually had to. Possibly a cracked rib or something like that for Yele Valais. Looks sore and he's not yet remounted like Danny Moreno has. Now, was that uh, accident within three kilometres? No, it was 3.4. 3.4 to go. So that was uh, that will be a time split for Danny Moreno, uh, should that be the case. Now, Jonas van, van Knechten has one lead out man now. As well, does uh, Chris Froome, just like Ian Stannard. We can just see there at the top screen that the Sky Rider just by the 1.9k kilometre on the screen. As Ian Stannard leading the red jersey, don't forget of Chris Froome. So Chris Froome, as ever, present. Just probably just making sure he doesn't want to Get, get caught up in this technical section, although in theory he hasn't got much to worry about now because of the 3k rule, but still, Chris Froome being Chris Froome, he's just going to play as safe as possible. Valet's uh, still not getting back on, just obliging a few people with their uh, cam smartphones out, videoing the misfortunes of the Belgian rider from Lotto Soudal. Meanwhile, uh, his teammate and compatriot Jens de Buscara is well placed right in the middle, those two red jerseys of Lotto Soudal, handily placed, but no team looks better at this point than the team on the right-hand side of the road. Matteo Trentin still got two riders working for him on the front. There it goes to Alaphilippe again on the front. It was Alaphilippe that made the difference on that on that second stage, on the first road stage, where it was him that ripped apart the peloton. So he's in that exact same role again, a little bit later than he was, but uh, they know that he can can be relied upon. But he's not got. He's got like a couple of seconds left. That's it. He's he's gone. So quick step. Ah, now down to just two riders. And this is what we said. They were going to set up before the 1K. The lead out is, is effectively over now for most teams. I don't know. My heart's in my mouth here slightly, David. It just feels uncontrolled, doesn't it? It feels very very ragged. The look of this. Uh, run in the kinds of teams involved. There's a couple of riders from Cannondale, one of whom is Tom van Aasbroek. Matteo Trentin finds himself bumped down now and losing the wheel of Yves Lampert, uh, his lead out man. Trek Segafredo have Edward Turns handily placed now towards the front. Van Aasbroek's being piloted very ably though up onto third wheel now, just bumping and bouncing with that rider from Trek Segafredo, Edward Turns. There's a sprint developing on the left hand side of the road as well as uh, Lotto Sudal are, are looking for Jens de Buscada who slips down now to about seventh place alongside Sasha Modolo from U. 
UAE Team Emirates. Now, he is a fast man. Watch out for that red helmet and that black and white kit. Just uh, bumping shoulders there with a the rider from Sunweb. Also, JJ Lobato from Team Lotto and El Yumbo. But Mate Matteo Trentin takes that corner beautifully well. A couple of hundred metres to go. Trentin is on the wheel of Lobato. Lobato and Trentin. Trentin now just waiting for his moment. Surely, can he get past the Spaniard from Team Lotto and El Yumbo? I think he will. Victory is going to go, I think, to quick step floors once again. Matteo Trentin, his first ever Vuelta his first ever victory on the Vuelta he justified his favoritism and the team that does this kind of thing so well have struck again great victory for Trentin he is an exceptional bike rider he's on the move leaving this team but he has rewarded Patrick Lefebvre's belief in him down the years that was an excellent excellent run-in it's the 71st stage within a grand tour for uh, Patrick Lefebvre's team it's different guises and it's a uh, that is quite a remarkable statistic, really, when you think about it. That's uh, the equivalent to three and a half Grand Tours in their entirety. And uh, although they don't, aren't known as a Grand Tour winning team, as a, when it comes to stages, they, they are arguably the best uh, in the world. And this is how he did it. You can see here, I mean, he's just trying, look how easy he's just waiting to jump. He's getting a perfect lead out. And the rider behind him, the Canada rider, can't even hold his Matteo Trentin's wheel at that point as he even begins. He was already losing the wheel when Matteo Trentin jumped. So Trentin was in complete control. His team set him up perfectly. And he's obviously in the condition of his life at the moment. Because if he can take it that easy and control that situation like that, then, yeah, he's, in, uh, he's at his prime. And that shake of the head from Labato there as he realized that it just played perfectly into Trentin's hands. And he did the lead out effectively for the attack. Italian, frustrated that he found himself on the front just too early. There's the result then. Trentin from Labato and Tom Van Asbrook taking third. With John Dagenkopf still sick, Trek Segafredo were riding for Edward Turns, although it was a John Dagenkopf type of finish. Jens de Buscara, Sasha Modolo, Lorenzo Manzan, Solon Kra Anderson, Yusef Regigi, and Yetzer Boll completed the top ten. Well, the quick step plan on stage two was for Matteo Trentin to win and take the red jersey. Changed on the fly to an improvised Yves Lampert win to take the red jersey. This time the plan worked as drawn up. The small matter of losing 23 minutes in the Pyrenees yesterday put paid to any chance Trentin had of taking the race lead at the second attempt, but he did take the green jersey from Vincenzo Nibali. Matteo, we were slightly worried for you when you only had one teammate left coming under the kilometre kite, but you got it done in the end. Yeah, we knew that the, the finish, uh, the final last kilometre was super technical and actually Lampard showed two days ago he can do one kilometre pretty well. So I was not worried about that, I was more, wor more worried to come into that roundabout in really first position. We got boxed in a little bit by two guys of Canada, but we could really manage to find our way to get to the front every time. So we play cool, we stay calm and uh, everything went well. And this continues a fantastic start to the Vuelta for you. Another fantastic season for Quick Step. We've heard lots about what the team's secret is over the last few years, but what do you think it is? I think it's just we go every day for, for winning and everyone in the team play his 100% every day. Uh, you could see today the clerk play uh, pool the whole day yesterday and he was the first guy hitting the, hitting the win today for us. And then... Again, uh, Niki, Jungers and all the other guys until Lampard, they really gave their best to, to go for the win. So that's, that's the secret of this team. And of course, you're leaving next year. You're going to be riding for another team. Are you slightly worried about losing some of the magic? Uh, I try to keep the magic with me. <laughs> but, you know, uh, that cycling, uh, you can stay, you can go. But uh, the best thing of this team that I'm, I'm sure that is going to stay is the friendship with all the guys, with all the team members of the staff, with uh, Patrick Lefebvre. Uh, with everyone involved in this team so that's that's something i will keep in my heart for uh, forever because we we're gonna be enemy in the race but friend of course when the race is finished trentin's teammates to be were on the podium to get the team prize today although for some reason on the vuelta it's always presented to the best team from the previous day's stage and orica were up there again in the figure of adam yates as best young rider a daily classification for which there's no actual jersey Odd. Anyway, on to the GC, in which the one real change is the disappearance of Domenico Pozzovivo, who had the misfortune to crash just 300 metres short of the three-kilometre mark, inside which, of course, he'd have been given the same time as the lead group. As a result, Roman Bardet moves up to ninth, and Simon Yates makes his first appearance in the top ten. So, Chris Froome's second ever day in the red jersey went better than his first, in that this time he held on to it, and without expending a massive amount of energy. He also managed to get the Velcro on it done up properly in time for his post-podium interview with Daniel Freed. Chris, we knew the team was slightly worried about the danger of crosswinds on the first half of the stage today, but it was fairly routine in the end. 
Yeah, relatively routine, but um, it was a very tricky final today. A lot of uh, tight corners in the last kilometer, in the last few kilometers. Um, so it was really important for us to stay up front today, and the, the guys did a fantastic job in, in keeping me up there. And a typical welter stage tomorrow with a steep finish. What should we look forward to from that? <laughs> I mean, yeah, hard to say already. I mean, it's uh, gonna, we're going to have to see what other teams are planning at this moment, but I, I th I've got a lot of confidence in the guys around me. They've ridden a, a great race up until now. And are you ready to keep this jersey from now until Madrid? I mean, we're not going to give anything away, definitely. Uh, we're going to fight for fight for this as long as we can and um, wherever we can. Bonus seconds, finishes, um, certainly not. there aren't going to be any gifts in this world.